Hello poetry lovers and poetry curious. I apologize if you hear a train going by in the background. Today I'm going to read to you from The Voice That Is Great Within Us, an anthology edited by Hayden Carruth. <clears throat> and my, my voice, I feel fine, but my voice is wanting to be really ragged today, so I'm going to be talking through that. So I'm going to be reading you Lethe by, I think it's HD, yep, HD, also known as Hilda Doolittle, Doolittle. Our randomized poetry element is musicality, so it'll be interesting to see how we get musicality here. So. Lethe is the river in the underworld um, that you drink from to forget everything. So that's what this is about. So Lethe by H.D. Nor skin nor hide nor fleece shall cover you, nor curtain of crimson nor fine shelter of cedar wood be over you, nor the fir tree, nor the pine, nor sight of wind, nor gorse, nor river you, nor fragrance of flowering bush, nor wailing of reed bird to waken you, nor linnet, nor of thrush, nor word, nor touch, nor sight of lover, you shall long through the night, but for this, the roll of the full tide to cover you without question, without kiss. So what do I like about it? Somehow I like the reduction. So this is supposed to be the river of forgetfulness. And so it's saying, well, if you're going to forget, this is everything they're taking away or a sample of the everything they're taking away, which includes a lot of um, the sensual uh, pleasures of life. And with that, that nor, 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 I think that hits a rhythm. Now, is it metrically even? I don't think so, but I... Would I call it musical? No, but do I think it creates a rhythm that carries it along? Yes, I do. To me, the only place where there's a hitch in it is where it says, you shall long through the night. It sounds like long as in a long period of time, but I don't think that that's what it's saying. I think it's yearn. Like, you shall yearn through the night, but for this. And then there's a colon. So it's telling you, you're not going to, you, you're not going to long for any of this stuff. You're not allowed to. You're not going to have anything. What you're going to long for, what you're going to yearn for, is for the role of the full tide to cover you without question, without kiss, without asking you any whys, and, what, and without giving you any sympathy whatsoever. At least that's what I take that kiss as being, without any sympathy, without any farewells. It's just all going to be removed. And I think, too, that this is taking some of its rhythm um, I don't even know how to say it. Uh, Some of its way of expressing, maybe from the Bible, and at least that sort of chant strikes me as something that would be in a religious text. Um, this also, I don't know if it's it's syllabic. Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
Let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, and she's um, not in, no, she's not monosyllabic. She is in places, though. Let me see, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Okay, so she might be um, syllabic here. So when I'm counting here, what I'm doing is I counted the first line of the first stanza. This is in three stanzas, so I counted the syllables in the first line of the first stanza, and then the first line of the second stanza, and they are the same. And she's cueing us here to some extent on this. I mean, you can see that some lines are shorter than others, um, but she also indents some. So let me see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Yep. So, and I thought maybe she was known for syllabic. So that means that you don't necessarily establish a given rhythm within a line, but you are limiting the lines to a certain number of syllables. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yep, she's being very regular. I'm just doing this pretty much through the first two. Um, stanzas. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. One, two, three, four, one, two, three. All right, so she's got these um, these stanzas that consist of one, two, three, four, five, six syllables, four syllables, eight syllables, ten syllables, four syllables, three syllables. That's the way they go. That's it's always interesting to me when people can do that and make any sense, but maybe having, you know, and that creates a, a swelling and then a decline. And so the end of each stanza feels fairly natural. If we're talking about musicality or rhythm, it seems fairly natural because it has, it has closed on nor the pine or nor the thrush or without kiss, you know, they're shortening. So I'm going to read that one more time, just the whole thing, and I'm just going to think now that I have noticed that. <laughs> so, nor skin, nor hide, nor fleece shall cover you, nor curtain of crimson, nor fine shelter of cedar wood be over you, nor the fir tree, nor the pine, nor sight of wind, nor gorse, nor, you, nor river you nor fragrance of flowering bush, nor wailing of reed bird to waken you, nor linnet, nor of thrush, nor of linnet, nor of thrush, nor word, nor touch, nor sight of lover, you shall long through the night, but for this, the roll of the full tide to cover you without question, without kiss. So I feel like it has musicality. We have you repeated at the end of the second and fourth line in every one. We have pine and fine. We have fleece. We have bush and thrush. So we do have some rhyme here. We have this and kiss. So we do have rhyme, but not all of them. Sight doesn't rhyme with anything. Gorse doesn't rhyme with anything. Fleece doesn't rhyme with anything. Those are the uh, last words of the first lines. And question and linnet and tree do not rhyme with anything. So there's, in every stanza, there's two, two of the six and words do not rhyme, and four of them do have rhymes. <laughs> um, or actually, one is just the repetition of you throughout. For every stanza, the second and the fourth line are the word you. 
So interesting. But I'm not going to dwell any further on that. Okay. So the question here, is this poem more thinking, um, actions, or observations? It's actually kind of instruction. It's not even, it's sort of declarative. This is the way it's going to be, but it, it's almost like instruction, you know. You come into the hospital and they start to tell you, you won't have this, you can't have that. What you will have in the very end, what you will have is this, or what in this case, what you will long for. Is this poem representative or abstract? It's representative in terms of naming the various things that are not going to be had. And I'm going to say it's pleasantly representative because it's putting me in a place that has cedar wood and fir tree and pine, even if the language is telling me I can't have that. So the image of things in itself is not the images or the things that are being called up are not unpleasant to think of or call to mind. So which nonfiction category is this poem most similar to? I'm going to say a religious text. Or a very religiously worded health book. <laughs> you shall not have these things. Um, yeah, I guess that's where I would go with those. All right, what fiction category is this poem most similar to? I'm going to say fantasy. I mean, let's face it, it, it is referring to something mythological. Uh, so could it be a fairy tale? Possibly. Um, but I could see this being... something a wizard would say to someone before they put someone through a trial of some kind in a fantasy novel. What musical category is this poem most similar to? Well, I have chant as one of the categories, and it kind of fits that. Sorry. I mean, a very barky, barky video. I have now closed the door on her, so at least if she barks, it will be muted. Um, okay, I'm going to say, so sometimes I think of chance kind of to invoke something. This is not invoking. Again, it's more instructional. But I could see this. This does remind me of kind of the rise and the fall of like a Gregorian chant or something like that. So I'm going to leave it at that, a chant. So is this poem obvious, subtle, or does it leave you scratching your head? I think that it would leave me scratching my head if I didn't know what the river Lethe was. So I think that the title is critical to understanding kind of what's going on here, that somebody is either being forced to forget something or is choosing to forget something um, because it otherwise isn't mentioned that there's any choice in the matter. So if, if I didn't have 
you know, that cue of the River Lethe in the title, then I wouldn't quite know if this is something, this, re, you know, retraction of all of these things from this person's life is something that was being forced upon them or if it was a punishment of some kind. Um, now, you know, we often don't choose our death, you know, but, and I don't know that much about the myth of Lethe, but my sense is that you are, clean, it's a sort of a cleansing. Um, that you are, well, I guess willingly or unwillingly subjecting yourself to. But it seems like this kind of instruction of letting you know what's going to be taken from you um, would be necessary if it was completely obligatory. So I'm going to say somewhere between subtle and scratching your head. Or scratching my head. I still am not like 100% sure why this person is going through this. So there is some head scratching there. Even though a lot of the things named in it and the way that it proceeds is not particularly confusing. It's just I, I don't quite know what's going on here. Does this poem progress in a linear way or a discursive way? Well, I would say it's pretty linear. It's actually doing the same thing for three and a three and a third, three and a third stanzas. It's just telling us what we're going to be without. Um, and then it makes a little bit of a turn by saying by telling us what we will long for is this for the tide of the river to completely cover us. Um, so pleasantly linear, yeah. Because if it were any less linear, then I would probably start to get confused and have more head scratching. <laughs> so. Um, what sorts... Next question is, what sort of visual art style is this poem most similar to? Hmm. The thing that came to mind was um, field painting. You know, field painting where there's no object in the painting, you just have a field of slightly varied color. So what I would what I would want to see is it would be a film, a very short film, in which a maybe muted depiction of a landscape, because that's mostly what we have here, is things in a lands in a landscape. Um, and have it visually dissolve into a field painting. Probably, in this case, a gray or near black field painting because we're going into this state of forgetfulness. Um, yeah, so that's it, <laughs> whatever that would be. Um, in a word or a phrase, what would you say is primarily being communicated by this poem? I would say that when we choose 
uh, to leave something to, behind. When we decide we want to forget something, to keep in mind everything that we are giving up. Because oftentimes, um, you know, when we, we're feeling some acute pain or depression or, or what have you, we're so focused on what is uncomfortable that we lose sight of what would be lost, you know, all of the other wonder and wonderfulness and pleasure that would be lost if we, and this happens in relationships too, right? You know, in an acute moment, we want to throw it all away, which is why, you know, you count to 10 and you maybe take a little time away and then come back so that you can consider things uh, a little more carefully before deciding to put something completely in the past or to wish it completely gone. That's what I would get out of it. Um, okay. Is um, is there anything, any other observation that I would like to share about this poem? Not particularly. Not particularly. So I'll let it go at that. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.